Foundation and Association Project ECHO of the University of New Mexico, and they're held weekly on a Wednesday afternoon. The chat will be open for questions, so please uh, either post them on the chat or if you feel like being more interactive, uh, just let us know. So we're going to kick off with the first um, talk, which is by Prof. Machika Sachedi, who's the head of our division at uh, Kuriski Hospital and University of Cape of infectious colitis in a patient with IBD. So, Mash, if you want to share your screen. Uh, great. Thank you, Jill, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present a case. So, we try to have a theme to all of our meetings so that, you know, the learning is a bit more focused. And the reason I chose to do this case is because I still find that, um, despite the fact that it's probably one of the commoner opportunistic infections that we see, there still is a lot of confusion about how to manage the patient. So this is the reason I chose the case and uh, I hope that uh, you'll be able to get just a few nuggets. It's not a comprehensive talk uh, on, on uh, the condition, but uh, just some nuggets. Um, and I thought it's been a while since we've done polls. So uh, I'm gonna start with the poll question, two poll questions, and then there'll be two further down the line. And I hope you participate and vote and really think about uh, the questions that I've been asked. They're not difficult, but I think sometimes they can be challenging uh, in a patient with IBD. All right, uh, Cheryl, if you would please uh, run the first question. Can you see it? Yes, I can. So the question is, is IBD an independent risk factor for C. difficile? And you can either answer yes or no, or only if a patient is having a flare, or only if a patient is on immunosuppression. So we'll give you about another 15 seconds or so. All right, I think, I think we can close the poll and have a look at the results. So 83% answered yes, 8% uh, no. Nobody took only if a patient is having a flare. And we have 8% of people who think only if a patient uh, is on immunosuppression. So when I do my talk, um, I will, you, you will get um, the answers to, to some of this. All right, I'm going to move on to the second question, uh, Cheryl. So the second question, please, please share the poll as well, is um, which statement is true? C. diff is more common. Uh, so let's do the second question. C. diff is more common in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's disease, or C. diff only occurs in patients with colonic disease? So it's changing a bit, but more than two thirds think it is more common in UC than Crohn's disease. And uh, about 25% think that it only occurs in patients with colonic disease. So I'm actually pleased with these answers because it means then that my talk is not, um, is I'm not talking to the converted. And, and, and this is what I have found. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a condition that we see often. Um, you can stop sharing the poll. Thanks, Cheryl. C often, and but there's a lot of confusion around C diff, uh, and as I say, um, which parts of the gut it uh, it affects, and and how to manage it, particularly in the IBD cohort. So I'm going to start with a clinical case. So this is a 46 year old man with a recent diagnosis of left sided ulcerative colitis, which was controlled with oral as well as rectal uh, five SA compounds. He then presented in outpatient uh, in August 2023 with diarrhea, gave a history of six loose stools per day with a little bit of mucus and abdominal pain. And this was his first relapse since he was diagnosed uh, with UC in December, 2021. There was no history of travel. He had not taken any additional medications over the counter preparations in states and so forth. Um, and the rest of his family was well. So there was nothing to suggest uh, an obvious precipitant and he had been um, compliant on his medication up until this point. So on examination, he looked unwell. He was pyrexial with a tachycardia, 
He had mild abdominal distension, but there was no evidence of uh, peritonitism. His blood test, you can see, showed that he had an elevated white cell count of 15.6 with an anemia. Uh, subsequently, he was shown to be mildly iron deficient. He had a ray CRP of 165 with a platelet count of 550. He had evidence of pre-renal impairment with a creatinine of 204, and the albumin was preserved. The chest X-ray was done, obviously, to exclude any uh, tuberculosis or any other uh, um, intercurrent uh, chest infection, and that was clear and he had no evidence of air under the diaphragm. He went on to have a flexible sigmoidoscopy as one does, and this showed severe uh, ulceration from the rectus sigmoid junction, extending beyond the limit of endoscopy. So um, he was, um, he, his procedure was up to 50, 60 centimeters uh, from the anal verge, and it was graded a Mayo subscore of three. The stool was subsequently sent uh, for MCNS. There were no organisms, so no Shigella, Salmonella, uh, and no fungal elements, but he did have an inflammatory stool with three plus leukocytes and two plus uh, red blood cells. And thankfully the um, um, C. diff uh, uh, test was sent um, before he was uh, given any uh, therapy and his GDH was positive, uh, but the toxin which in our setup is done uh, at the same time. So it's a, it's a two stage test, uh, which we do. Um, and that, that was negative. So on to the third question. Based on uh, the C. diff results, so GDH positive, but toxin negative, what is your interpretation of the result? Does the patient have C. diff? B, does the patient not have C. diff? Or C, the patient has non-toxin producing C. diff? And based on the answer so far, Ah, it's changing. <laughs> so most people were going for the patient as non-toxin producing C. diff. In the earlier vote, some people believe the patient has C. diff, 30%. And uh, the other 70% think the patient has C. diff, but it's non-toxin producing. We do have an individual who thinks the patient does not have C. diff. Okay. Again, I, I think uh, it's good that uh, we are doing this topic because you can see already from the range of answers that the interpretation is really dependent on, 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 on what people know or, or what people uh, don't know. So the patient was started on, uh, he was treated for his IBD flare. So he was started on 100 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone, six hourly. He was given oral vancomycin despite the negative uh, toxin test. And I think because of his, um, tachycardia, pre-renal impairment, uh, hypovolemia, and those features, uh, IV metronidazole was added, which I think was absolutely the right thing to do. He seemed to improve on the first day, but by the second and third day, it was clear that he was continuing to have loose stools uh, despite uh, therapy. So the final question is, what will you do now? Will you repeat the C. diff test? A, to see if he still has infection, uh, or for whatever reason, B, would you escalate treatment uh, for IBD? What would you do then in the situation? Uh, so most for now would repeat the C. diff tests and then 15% uh, would escalate therapy. I mean, it may be that both options are actually correct. So um, just keep that in mind. All right, so I just wanted to use this case and these poll questions just to make several key points. And maybe at the end, we can even have a discussion uh, if people disagree, um, but the guidelines are clear. And then I think interpretation of the guidelines and what one does in the clinical uh, setup uh, may be different to what the guidelines suggest. So just in terms of the risk factors of a, a C. diff infection in IBD now, it is an independent risk factor. And in fact, it's probably the commonest uh, independent risk factor outside of the traditional risk factor. So it's one of the commonest opportunistic infections for community acquired C. diff. So the patient does not need to have had previous antibiotic exposure, certainly does not need to have been hospitalized. So just IBD in its own right is an independent risk factor for C. diff particularly community-acquired acetone. Obviously, patients in the hospital will also have an additional risk factor. Uh, 
Important to note that patients with IBD are five times more likely to develop C. diff than patients without IBD. And this is a, um, consistent across many, many studies and meta-analyses uh, that have been done. Important to note that there's no difference in the prevalence or incidence of C. diff in patients who have UC and patients who've got Crohn's dis uh, disease colitis. So absolutely no difference. And I know the, the thinking sometimes is that we think it's obviously going to be more common in UC, but this is not the case. And the data has, has borne uh, that, that fact. Something else to note is that it is also true, though, that patients with colonic involvement are more likely to develop C. diff than patients without colonic involvement. But C. diff enteritis is an entity. It's not common, but it does exist. So don't forget that it is in the different of patients who've got terminal ileitis, um, it always needs to be thrown uh, C. diff as a possible uh, differential. So don't forget that it can affect the small bowel as well. And then I think most of you know this, that C. diff is significantly more frequent in patients experiencing flares than in both patients with inactive IBD and in the non-IBD groups. And I think we know this, and hence we do screen patients uh, for C. diff at every flare, which is the the right uh, way to manage these patients. Now, in terms of uh, the risk of uh, developing C. diff uh, and the use of IBD drugs, so there is a significant association between biologics, specifically the anti-TNFs, and uh, the risk of acquiring C. diff infection. And the OR is there, you can see it's 1.6, so almost two, so it's not insignificant. But there has been no evidence, at least to date, to suggest that there's an association with the use of 5 assay compounds or thiopurines. So that includes AZA, 6-MP, methotrexate, uh, or even MMF in unusual cases, or cyclosporin. Steroids, in combination with infliximab, as well as steroids uh, with adalimumab, have a twofold risk of increasing uh, the, the chance of a person getting um, um, C. diff. So um, when you're treating a patient with an acute flare and you start them off on steroids and then they don't respond and you have to escalate therapy uh, to infliximab, then the risk of uh, C. diff increases. And the logistic regression analysis haven't shown whether this risk is increased because the patient has been hospitalized, may have received antibiotics, or whether this is strictly um, related to the medication. I don't think the studies are able to control for just the drug versus the other uh, risk factors uh, when you're dealing with a patient who is sick, uh, who deserves uh, the sort of treatment. And then in terms of vedozumab, it appears that the data is limited, but in most of the studies that have been reported so far, there have been incidents of a C. diff reported in the patients who are in the vedozumab arm. So there may be a signal that a vedo may in its own right also increase the risk possibly for uh, the development uh, of C. diff. But again, whether this is controlled for other risk factors uh, uh, is unclear uh, from my reading. I think the most important thing I wanted to say today is you have to recognize that it is associated with morbidity and mortality. So it's not just another infection in the patient who's got IBD. One has to screen for it and one has to treat it because it has a, a outcome, a, a, um, outcome implications. So patients with C. diff require longer hospitalization. They tend to require escalation in IBD therapy. They tend to have increased readmission rates. They tend to spend more on their therapies. So it must be recognized. And they have a higher long-term collecting risk of two, not insignificant. They also have significant higher short-term as well as long-term mortality uh, in patients uh, who have IBD. So um, if nothing else um, makes sense to you today, I hope this is a slide that you take that you really have to screen for it and you have to treat it aggressively uh, because these patients uh, over time, as well as in the short term, do suffer uh, complications. What do we do about testing? So we know that we screen at every IBD flare, especially if the patient is on immunosuppressants. But I would say, the guidelines say, especially if the patient is on, is on immunosuppressants, as a person, but I would say any patient with IBD, you should screen uh, for uh, C. diff and of course all the other infectious agents. Now the diagnosis requires that there must be diarrhea plus toxigenic uh, C. diff. So you cannot have a diagnosis without the diarrhea and without the toxin. 
And what they suggest is a two-step approach where you start with the GDH or uh, NAAT test. So that's a nucleic acid uh, test. We don't have that. We have the GDH test that would just like, be keen to hear what other tests uh, are being used uh, in other centers. So that is your initial uh, screening test. And then the second step is then to look for the toxin. And the toxin must be A and B enzyme. And I'll let you know why later. So you must find out whether your laboratory is testing for A and B or just A or just B, because that's a very important uh, point. Otherwise you might miss out on the other toxigenic uh, strains. Now this test um, is not very specific, so it can detect non-toxigenic strains. If you don't uh, use the toxin uh, immunoassay, then there's a test which is called the cytotoxicity neutralization assay. We don't have it. This is reported uh, in the guidelines as the gold standard. And then you need toxigenic culture. So that's an additional test that you can do, uh, which has much better sensitivity than a CCNA. The problem with that is that it's not available everywhere um, and you need uh, uh, people who A non toxigenic a non toxigenic strain. So, um, but um, if the test is negative, you need a confirmatory test. And then if that confirmatory test uh, is positive, then the patient has got C. So if toxin is positive, then the patient has got a C diff. In our setting, if the GDH antigen is positive, they do, they do a toxin immediately. If that's negative, then they do a gene expert PCR test to look for toxin. If that is positive, then the patient has got C diff. If that is negative, then the patient has got um, no C diff. But if you've done a GDH and it's positive and you've done a toxin test and that is negative, um, we do a PCR, as I say. If you don't have a PCR gene expert, you can use a net. Uh, and again, if that is negative, then that rules out a C. diff. But if it's positive, then the patient has got a C. diff. The point of all of this is that the guidelines say do not use a single test or one test as a standalone test. You need a screening test and then you need a confirmatory test. And basically you need diarrhea plus the screening test that's positive and then a confirmatory test uh, that is positive to say that the patient has got CD. So you should ideally not be sending formed stool to the lab for testing. You should be sending a fresh stool, ideally. Uh, and there are other things that can interfere with the assessment uh, of, of C. diff and, and we need to be aware of those. And as I say, the important thing is make sure that your laboratory is doing both toxin A and toxin B. So the number of toxigenic strains that are only toxin A is only 3%. So if your lab is only doing toxin A, then you're missing more than 90% of the toxigenic uh, strains of C. diff. Uh, and so you may be underestimating um, the incidence of C. diff in your population. In terms of treatment, so we know that you give oral vanco, 125 milligram, or if it is available, you can do, use fidexomycin at 200 milligrams BD. The treatment is for 10 days. And this is for non-severe uh, C. diff. And it has been shown that fidexomycin is non-inferior to vancomycin. However, both of these are superior to oral metrodinazole in a patient who's got non-severe C. diff. So the treatment of choice is vanco or fidexomycin. We don't have fidexomycin, so we use oral vanco. The only time that uh, you are allowed to use oral metronidazole for patients with non-severe C. diff is if you don't have any of the two above available. So if you don't have Vanco and you don't have fidexomycin, then you can use oral metronidazole also for 10 days, but only if those two are not available. For severe uh, C. diff, you will use Vanco or fidexomycin and add IV metronidazole again for 10 days, as was done uh, with this patient. And this is for patients who've got ileus and they've got uh, other, other problems. So that's important. Now, fulminant C. diff is uh, described as patients who've got diarrhea with a positive uh, test, but they also have hypertension, shock, ileus, megacolon. Here you increase the dose to 500 milligrams uh, QID with IV metronidazole eight hourly. 
And obviously you have to watch very carefully for um, any signs of uh, perforation or, or deterioration, in which case you need to assess whether the patient may be a surgical candidate. What I've not said here is that you can also do um, anal um, uh, vancomycin uh, in a patient like this. But as I say, involve your surgeons early because this is a patient who may end up uh, with uh, severe aseptic uh, complications. Important to note that if you're having a patient with an IBD flare, you don't need to wait to treat the C. diff before you escalate your therapy uh, for IBD. So you, you don't have to necessarily wait for the uh, results to come back from the lab. You can treat your IBD. If you have a high index of suspicion for C. diff, you can start your oral vancomycin while waiting for the results. You shouldn't wait, uh, particularly in a patient uh, who's very sick. What do you do with a patient who has a first recurrence? So you treat the patient, they do well, but they have a recurrence. So the guidelines suggested that you use vancomycin at the same dose, 125, or fidexomycin. Um, if the patient comes back with a second um, recurrence, then you do tapered vanco, or you can use vancomycin with rifaximin. We don't have that in the state sector. I'm not sure how many people are using it uh, in private. Or you can use uh, fidexomycin, 200 milligrams daily for 10 days. Or if you have access or are using it, then you can uh, do FMT. Just to note that um, just recently in, uh, in April, uh, the FDA approved uh, capsules of FMT. So if you can get those and, and they are equivalent to um, FMT in the way we used to, to do it before and in the way that we know it. And then a monoclonal antibody against C. diff, it's called Vezlotozumab, I can't pronounce it, is actually only used to, prefer, to prevent uh, recurrence. So um, it's not used for uh, recurrent C. diff when the patient has got recurrent C. diff, but it is used to try and prevent uh, a recurrence. And then I think this might be my final slide. What about repeat testing? So for non-IBD patients, it is not recommended to do repeat testing for C. diff because the shedding of the spores continues for, for weeks. And so you could have false, false, false positive uh, results. But for IBD patients, if a patient has ongoing symptoms after adequate treatment, they do suggest that you repeat uh, testing uh, for C. diff while escalating uh, therapy uh, for IBD. So just to go back to the question that was asked, um, I think uh, it is reasonable uh, in IBD patients to repeat uh, C. diff, but not in non-IBD uh, patients. So yeah, that's all that I wanted to share, just to highlight those specific points about the management uh, of C. diff in this group of patients. In our setting, and Joel, you can, um, you can correct me, even if the toxin is negative, and sometimes even if the PCR, so the gene expert is negative for the toxin, but the GDH was positive, depending on how sick the patient is, we do treat empirically with Venko because you have nothing to lose in a patient like this who's got a flare and they have a GDH antigen which was positive, but the toxin is negative. We tend to cover them anyway with uh, oral vancomycin. So we are deviating a little bit from the guidelines, but as I've shown you, the mortality is quite high and uh, Vanco is relatively safe, so I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, would you agree with that, Joe? Absolutely, 100% concur. As you said, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain um, if uh, the tests have got it wrong. And um, Mash, you didn't uh, mention it, but do you want to comment on the endoscopic appearance of C. diff in an IBD setting? So that's a very important point. So pseudomembranes can occur in other conditions other than uh, C. diff. And in fact, in patients with IBD, we don't often see a pseudomembranes. So this is the reason why we do a flexible, not to look for pseudomembranes, but to exclude C. diff on biopsy and also obviously to rule out a CMV, which is another cause of a refractory uh, uh, IBD. So um, pseudomembranes, and I've said this, I think, to the fellows before at SPEAR, there are many other infectious conditions, bacteria, viral, and whatever, they can also present like a pseudomembranes. Ischemic uh, colitis can give you a pseudomembranes, radiation, and a whole list of another different diagnosis. So those are not diagnostic. They are not synonymous uh, with, the, with C. diff uh, because there are many other causes for that.
Absolutely. And just one last thing, this is just for my personal interest, because I'm, I'm not quite sure I know the answer entirely to this question. What is the safety of um, FMT if we've got our patients on highly potent immunosuppressive therapies like anti-TNFs, etc.? I don't know the answer directly to that, but um, I imagine that the studies would have been done in the context of patients where you are escalating uh, therapy. And I've read a lot of case reports where the patient is not responding and they actually escalate to infliximab and then the patient actually responds and does well. So my sense is that it is safe uh, to, to do that if necessary. And so there, there's no indication to withhold the therapy that a patient needs for their IBD uh, if, if they are not uh, responding to treatment. Okay. Having treated the, the CD adequately. Okay, perfect. There is one question here on the chat. When you repeat a test for C. diff and IBD, do I've lost it now? Here we go. Uh, when you repeat a test for C. diff and IBD, do you repeat the DDH not or toxin testing or both? I would repeat both. both. I would repeat both. Yeah. Okay, Matt. I think we should move on to my talk. I'm going to run out of time, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Thanks, Joe. Okay, can you see yes, my yes. slides and you can hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit about opportunistic infections in the setting of our IBD therapies, and I'm going to highlight some of the more common ones with a couple of cases that we've managed in our unit over the years. So the simplest definition of an opportunistic infection is one which is either more common or more severe in an immunocompromised individual. And in IBD, the risk is largely related to our immunosuppressive medications, because besides fiber minus salicylates, all of our IBD meds confer some degree of risk. This is not uniform. It depends on several factors, such as the class of therapy prescribed, some drugs like steroids and purposes of the dosage that's used, as well as other patient-related factors that increase immunosuppression, advanced age, diabetes, HIV, malnutrition, and of course, disease activity. Um, as we all know, the more immunosuppressive drugs we give with different mechanisms of action, the higher is going to be your risk of developing an opportunistic infections. So corticosteroids, um, drugs that we often use and are really, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous drugs at our disposal, have long been associated with opportunistic infections, particularly when used at high doses for prolonged periods of time. And this is across the board, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And again, especially if used in combination with other immunosuppressive therapies, notably the JAK inhibitors, the thiopurines, and the anti-TNFs. So the more hits the patient has, the more likely they are going to get an opportunistic infection. All right, so the common one, uh, of course, with corticosteroids is oral or um, esophageal candidiasis. Methotrexate, fortunately, does not appear to uh, confer any real risk of opportunistic infections. The thiopurines are much more of a concern, and this is particularly for viruses. And interestingly, there is no association with the degree of drug-induced lymphopenia. The most common and severe viral infections are varicella zoster, CMV, EBV, and um, uh, herpes simplex. And for me, the most concerning is a primary EBV virus infection in a non-immune host on a thiopurine, because there is this increased risk of developing a primary lymphoproliferative disorder, which can be fatal. So, it is really best to avoid thiopurines if a patient is EBV IgG negative. So the first case is a 21-year-old woman, non-smoker, no past medical history, diagnosed with ileocecal Crohn's disease three years previously, had an opportunistic infection screen at diagnosis, which was favorable with the exception of varicella zoster IgG, which was negative. She received two courses of uh, uh, oral budesonide, um, and then it was decided to start her on azathioprine. She was heterozygote positive for the TPM T3C genotype. So she was started on a low dose, 50 milligrams, and this was slowly increased to 125 milligrams. And she's responded very well and uh, looked like resolution of her inflammation on a follow-up MRE. She then presented to our clinic with a three-day history of headache, myalgia, and a skin rash, no GIT symptoms. On examination, she had a uh, fever and a tachycardia and the obvious cutaneous manifestations of varicella zoster involving multiple dermatomes across her chest wall and her abdominal wall. The CRP was 71. She had an MCD which was elevated and a lymphopenia suggesting that her azathioprine was in fact therapeutic. And viral screen was negative with the exception of varicella zoster PCR which was positive. 
She had um, increased ALT and ASP um, and underwent an ultrasound of her liver, which was normal. So she was started on intravenous acyclovir. In our ward, two days later, she had a seizure, which uh, resolved with no neurological squealing. But in any case, she had a contrasted CT brain, which was normal, as well as a lumbar puncture, which showed some lymphocytes. And no surprise, varicella zoster PCR was positive on the CSA. She received intravenous acyclovir for two weeks. The LFTs normalized and there were no further seizures. And she was discharged on one month of um, oral acyclovir. A month later, she was started on adalimumab and she um, it went into a deep remission. So the reason I presented this case was just to highlight the risk of varicella zoster with conventional steroids, notably high-dose corticosteroids and thiopurines. And it can, as in this case, be severe with disseminated disease involving multiple dermatomes, meningitis, and hepatitis. So vaccination strategies are just important with our conventional therapy. There's been so much hype about varicella zoster in the setting of JAK inhibitors that everybody's forgotten that the risk is very high with thiopurines. And wherever possible, one should try and vaccinate uh, against um, herpes zoster in all patients, ideally at diagnosis. So moving on to the anti-TNFs, these are the drugs available to us that carry the highest risk of opportunistic infections, mostly bacterial and fungal, uh, much less commonly viral infections, with the exception of the notable risk of hepatitis B reactivation. And patients um, who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive should receive antiviral therapy, ideally two weeks before starting the anti-TNA. But those who are surface antigen negative but core antibody positive can just be followed up regularly with viral loads, LFTs, and possibly repeating the surface antigen at regular intervals. The FDA also warns specifically against other viral and bacterial opportunistic infections, notably Legionella and Listeria as well as invasive fungal infections. Um, I think the commonest that we're going to see in South Africa will be candidiasis and aspergillosis. Of course, active TB, um, including a reactivation of latent TB, is a major concern with the anti-TNS. And once again, combining drugs, anti-TNFs with immunomodulators and corticosteroids further increases uh, the risk. And of course, the risk of TB depends very much on the local disease burden. So, we need to exclude active tuberculosis in all patients being considered for an anti-TNF. And once that has been excluded, they all need to be tested for latent TB. The WHO recommends a chest X-ray and either a tuberculin skin test or an interferon gamma-releasing assay. And if either of these are positive, the patient should receive treatment for latent tuberculosis. Some guidelines recommend completing treatment for latent TB before starting an anti-TNF. I think this is absolutely impossible, really, in clinical practice. Because you, you cannot wait that long. Um, ECHO recommends delaying anti-TNFs until at least four weeks of the treatment for latent TB has been completed, if it's possible. So there are multiple different regimens that uh, are approved for treating latent TB. The WHO recommends them all equally. Other societies do uh, suggest a, a, a rifamycin containing a regimen because it can be given for a short period of time. In our unit, we use isoniazid as a nine-month uh, course. So this is the second case. She's a 22-year-old woman. She's a heavy smoker, diagnosed with Crohn's colitis at the age of 10. She was treated with sulfazalazine and did surprisingly well. Aged of 16, she was transitioned from our pediatric hospital to our IBD um, adult service. And shortly thereafter, she developed pulmonary TB, for which she was treated for six months, but then she was lost to follow up for three years. Came back to the clinic with a flare of her Crohn's colitis. Received a short course of prednisone. And over the year or so that followed, she received azathioprine and methotrexate with really no um, uh, control of her active disease. It was motivated for vedolizumab, given her previous uh, uh, TB. Um, unfortunately, our drug and therapeutics committee declined um, the vedolizumab and insisted that we cycle through an anti-TNF biosimilar before considering a more expensive therapy. So with trepidation, she was started on adalimumab. Before this was given, she um, had active TB excluded, uh, induced sputums, which were negative for TB and a chest X-ray, didn't look like any active disease, just old scarring from her previous TB. So she was started on isoniazid and pyridoxine, and you can imagine how nervous we are when you look at that chest X-ray of hers. Absolutely no surprise when six weeks later she presented with loss of weight, cough, and night sweats, and a new pleural effusion. 
and both the pleural aspirate and sputum were gene expert positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Fortunately, this was sensitive to rifampicin, and after two months of anti-TB therapy, she started on bezalizumab. And I haven't actually seen her of recent. And I have seen her hanging around the clinic. So maybe one of the other guys would like to comment afterwards on how she's actually doing on her bezalizumab. The third case is a 20-year-old woman. She's a non-smoker with no past medical history, diagnosed with extensive ileocolonic Crohn's disease in 2020, complicated by perianal fistulas, for which she had an examination under anesthesia and sequins were inserted. Over the years that followed, she failed as a thiopurine methotrexate. She was referred for up adacitinib trial and was considered a treatment failure. So it was decided to start her on infliximab monotherapy. And again, as is our practice, we put her on isoniazid with pyridoxine. At this point in time, we do not have access to interferon gamma releasing assays or tuberculin skin tests. So it's standard practice in our clinic given the very high rates of exposure to pulmonary TB that all our patients will receive latent TB um, therapy when they get uh, an anti-TNF. And she did quite well. But then she was seen in our clinic with three weeks of nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. There was, of course, concern over a secondary loss of response to infliximab. She was quite toxic, temperature of 38.7, a tachycardia, and this very strange indurated skin lesion above her um, her left clavicle and a very underlying, uh, underlying and large tender lymph node. On examination of her abdomen, there was severe generalized abdominal tenderness. Rectal examination showed quiescent perianal disease with no evidence of a perianal abscess. She had a white cell count of 18, a CRP of 126, and an albumin of 27. She had an urgent CT abdomen performed and which showed a large pelvic collection as well as splenic microabscesses and several large intra-abdominal lymph nodes. She was started on gifotaxime and metronidazole, and a percutaneous drain was inserted. The fluid was sent for microbiology. Um, no acid fast bacilli were seen on ZN staining. Gene expert uh, was negative for mycobacterium tuberculosis, but the adenosine deaminase in the fluid was uh, two times the upper limit of normal. So needless to say, we were unhappy to attribute this case scenario to complicated Crohn's disease, given the splenic microabscesses, the large nose on uh, CT, and the raised adenosine deaminase, which were suggestive of disseminated tuberculosis. So the decision was made to do a lymph node biopsy of that uh, supraclavicular node, and this came back with necrotizing suppurative inflammation, positive for acid bacilli, and anti-TB therapy was initiated. And the plan was, to commence her on bedalizumab after she completed uh, a few months of anti-tuberculous therapy. So what did I learn from these two cases? Well, I think treatment of latent TB infection is not foolproof. Remember, both of these patients were on isoniazid and pyridoxine when they developed their TB. Even with a six-month duration of isoniazid therapy, the five-year risk of developing TB is only reduced by 65% whilst nine months of isoniazid confirms only 90% protection. So there's still 10% of patients who are going to get this complication. So we need to maintain a high index of suspicion for mycobacterium tuberculosis, even in those patients who are receiving INH uh, or any latent TB infection prophylaxis. And my final case is a 26-year-old woman uh, diagnosed with UC um, in... It's not 2021, that's wrong. Um, it was a very mild presentation, Mayo 2 in the rectum, Mayo 1 up to the splenic flexure. She was initially well controlled on oral and topical fiber minor salicylates. A few months after diagnosis, she was admitted with acute severe ulcerative colitis. She was treated with intravenous hydrocortisone with a partial response. So it was decided to give her infliximab rescue therapy, and she had a dramatic improvement within 48 hours and she was discharged on a tapering course of prednisone with an optimization of her, um, her 5 m salicylate therapy. 10 days later, her mother brought her into casualty with a headache, nausea, and vomiting. She had um, a high temperature of 39. She had obvious meningism. Glasgow Comet Scale was 15 out of 15, and there were no focal neurological signs. She had a contrasted CT scan of the brain, which was normal, and the casualty officer went on to do a lumbar puncture, which shows a raised um, CSF protein, lots of polymorphs and some lymphocytes, 
uh, cryptococcal latex agglutination test was negative. Um, there were no organisms seen on the grand stain. So she was diagnosed with presumed bacterial meningitis and was started on intravenous keftriaxone and intravenous ampicillin, ending uh, blood and CSF cultures. She was then transferred back to RK. But over the next 24 hours, she deteriorated rapidly. She became drowsy and confused. She developed a left-sided hemiplegia and multiple cranial nerve palsies. The third, fourth, sixth, and seventh on the left, and the fourth and lower motor neuron seventh on the right. Intravenous TB treatment was added because obviously the risk of the cranial nerve palsy with the TB arachnoiditis. And at that time, we received some additional results. Um, her uh, viral screen was negative, as was her FTA, and her toxoplasma IgG and IgM came back as negative. So we requested an urgent neurological consultation, and they suggested doing an MRI, despite the fact that the patient had an entirely normal CT scan done just 24 hours previously. And this showed multiple enhancing white matter lesions in the prons, the midbrain, and the right hemisphere. And um, they were pretty certain they were dealing with a brainstem rhomboencephalitis, almost certainly due to Listeria monocytogenes. And they were in fact right, because the blood culture subsequently confirmed the diagnosis. But she received one week of intravenous gentamicin and six weeks of ampicillin. And in our ward, she showed some gradual improvement. She was discharged after some time to a rehabilitation facility for physio, OT, and speech therapy. A repeat MRI showed a um, complete resolution of the lesions. And fortunately, her UC seemed to be reasonably well controlled on optimized doses of oral and rectal mesalazine. At her last visit, which was some, some time back, she had permanent neurological sequelae with dysarthria, ptosis, divergence, stabrismus, and diplopia. And although she was able to walk with a stick, she had a markedly spastic gait. So the lessons that I learned while I was reading up about this case at the time is that CNS listeria infection typically manifests early after initiating anti-TNF therapy, usually after just one uh, infusion or two infusions. So this is not just a complication of longer-term anti-TNF therapy, and you need to have a high index of suspicion up front. Because if therapy is delayed, there is a 30% mortality, and more than 50% of patients will have permanent neurological sequelae. So anybody who presents with uh, central nervous system features on an anti-TNF always put listeria high up on the risk of your differential diagnosis. And if the CT brand is normal, which it more than often is, uh, MRI is probably the best treatment uh, for uh, uh, scanning uh, the central nervous system. I'm just moving briefly on to some of the newer agents. Um, the first is vedolizumab, which you all know is a gut-selective monoclonal antibody targeting alpha-4 beta-7 integrin, essentially inhibiting the traffic of lymphocytes into the gastrointestinal tract. And it has an excellent safety profile, not surprising given its GI-specific mechanisms of action with a very low risk of opportunistic infections in both the randomized controlled trials and in the post-marketing studies. And there really is also a really large um, body of real world evidence supporting this observation. There may be a small increase in the risk of gastrointestinal infections, notably C. diff, as Mashiko has already pointed out in her presentation. But unlike uh, natalizumab, which was the predecessor of lidolizumab, there have been no cases reported of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and no signal for tuberculosis. Histokinimab, of course, um, the first anti-interleukin approved in IVD targeting IL-12 and IL-23. Now, this particular pathway, uh, particularly IL-23, is involved in the defense against bacterial and fungal infections. So theoretically, this drug should carry the risk of an opportunistic infection, notably TB and invasive uh, candidiasis. Fortunately, this has not been shown to be the case, and we now have long-term data from um, the uh, UNI-T uh, and uni -Fi programs in UC and Crohn's disease, which have not shown any safety signals. And we also have data from... Um, uh, uh, pool data from across five uh, different indications up to five years, and the rates of opportunistic infection, including active TB, were very low and similar to placebo. And a meta-analysis of 41 observational studies comprising a large number of, uh, of IBD patients uh, receiving ustekinimab, there were no cases of TB or invasive candidiasis. So I think this drug has an excellent safety profile in terms of infections. 
And then just finally, the JAK inhibitors. Um, so this is topocitinib, and there are some new ones, uh, Fulgotinib and Ubedacitinib, which are not available um, here in uh, South Africa, but are approved in the, uh, by the FDA and in the EU. But the one that we do have available is topocitinib, which is a non-selective uh, JAK inhibitor, inhibiting um, JAK1 and 3, and at higher doses, JAK2. And there is an increased risk of opportunistic infections, but this is largely due to herpes zoster. And you can see in the forest plot on, on the right that this appears to be a class effect, probably lowest for uh, fulgotinib, uh, highest for adacitinib, and tofacitinib lying uh, somewhere in between. The risk is increased further in the elderly and patients who are receiving higher doses, the 10 milligram BB dose particularly. Fortunately, the most cases are mild, just involving one or two dermatomes, very seldom disseminated, and it can of course be circumvented with vaccination. Now, in South Africa, unfortunately, we do not have access to the recombinant inactive Shingrix vaccine, which is very safe to give. Here, we have to rely on the live vaccines, um, which is very problematic because it requires uh, two doses three weeks apart, and then you have to wait an additional three weeks before you can actually start immunosuppressive therapy. And very often in our IBD patients, we don't have six weeks uh, available to wait before you start uh, some kind of an immunosuppressive drug. One thing that I was a little concerned about was the tuberculosis that was picked up in the global topocitinib rheumatoid arthritis program, where 58 cases of active TB were um, identified. Fortunately, almost all of them were from high prevalence areas. And rather reassuringly, quite recent data <clears throat> on the global tofacinative ulcerative colitis clinical program up to eight years, no cases of mycobacterium tuberculosis were identified. There was certainly an increase in the risk of herpes zoster, as we would have expected, but otherwise no increased risk of opportunistic infections. And we also have um, some uh, real-world data, a meta-analysis of a large number of, of, of trials, which do not support an increased risk of TB in patients taking tofacitinib. So the take-home messages from this talk, conventional therapies confer an increased risk of opportunistic infections, and the ones that we have to be most scared about are high-dose steroids and thiopurines, which are often overlooked. So vaccination is important in all our IBD cases, not just those um, who are taking JAK inhibitors, and ideally at diagnosis wherever it's possible. Anti-TNFs are the drug class with the highest risk of opportunistic infections, and obviously tuberculosis, either reactivation or a new infection, remains um, the most important. Just remember, treatment for latent TB is not foolproof, and it will not prevent a new infection. So always maintain a high index of suspicion in uh, patients treated with anti-TNFs. And in patients on anti-TNFs with new onset neurological symptoms or symptoms of meningitis, always consider hysteria monocytogeny. Um, thanks very much, and I'll take some questions. Uh, thank you, Jill. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think you hit home the really important messages about vaccination, which I think we don't do very well uh, for our patients, checking that they've had their vaccinations uh, and encouraging them to get uh, vaccinations if they are not being vaccinated. And Hep B is available. There is no reason why people should not be vaccinated against hepatitis B. You know, you don't struggle to get it. I think that's the first important point. And um, highlighting you know, things that we don't think of, we always think about TB and we think about lymphoma and so forth, but we forget infections like listeria, candida, you know, systemic candidiasis can be very, very difficult uh, to treat and patients usually have a poor outcome. So thanks for highlighting uh, those clinical cases. I was wondering that if cost wasn't an issue, you know, budesonide is very, very expensive, but would you suggest that if it was affordable, where we could use budesonide to minimize the systemic effects. Uh, that would probably be the way to go because I think we give steroids so often that we actually um, don't appreciate the side effects that are associated with steroids. We're always worried about anti-TNFs and the therapy, but steroids, as good a drug as they are, they really have got terrible, terrible side effects apart from the metabolic uh, you know, problems that they cause. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm actually, I think, you know, absolutely, budesonide would certainly be my first choice of course, it for patients with ileocecal Crohn's disease. Unfortunately, 
the formulation that we have available to us does not work in the colon. So that doesn't particularly help us. There are uh, MMX formulations which do work in the colon, but we don't have them available to us. And I, I'm not sure if they're actually approved. Uh, I don't think so in the private sector. I don't know if anybody's on the call. Perhaps Chris will know. Um, that's a drug called ulcerous. Um, but I think, unfortunately, for especially, especially acute severe ulcerative colitis or moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, we're always going to have to fall back on the dreaded corticosteroids. Yeah. Just, I, I really only covered opportunistic infections in this talk because serious infections is another whole different story. Um, and just to point out that the most common serious infection that patients get on anti-TNS is strep pneumonia. And pneumococcal vaccine, it's a no-brainer. It really should we um vaccinate if you can absolutely yeah um Kay, i say you, you put a question up why don't you put on your screen and just ask it would be lovely <laughs> to see <laughs> no pressure no no pressure Again, um, I'm, I'm not appropriately dressed mishita <laughs> i don't know what i was going to do yesterday so i'm not putting my screen on I can understand that, but, but maybe it was just a, just a comment that we can get Shingrix, and but it's very expensive. Um, so we've got someone who imports ten doses at a time, and we've had a few patients and um, who've had Zoster who've then gone on and had vaccination. So if you can vaccinate them prior to immunosuppression with the older vaccine, that's obviously important because once they're on immunosuppression, we we, we can't do it unless they've got yeah. lots of money. Sure, sure. So, Kay, are they getting it from overseas, obviously, and bringing it here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's not, it's obviously not approved in South Africa. And I, I, I've heard from my colleagues that it's it's still wickedly expensive, even in their countries. Yeah, so it's one of the travel clinics. They do a separate application, but they have to bring in a minimum of 10 doses at a time. So okay. someone has to be prepared to fork out 50,000 rand up front. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. By combining <laughs> patients, we've managed to do it for a few patients who really needed it. Right, yeah. right. While we've got you, do you have the MMX preparation in private? No. You no, just the standard BNSNI. Just the standard yeah. BNSNI. I don't think it's approved. Well, certainly I haven't heard uh, anything about it being approved. No, yeah. no I haven't either. Um, I encourage others to please ask questions. Um, while you're coming up with the questions, Jill, can I ask you to just clarify something about um, T-cell lymphoma in young men who are EBV negative? So is it combination therapy that can cause the hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma or even monotherapy? It and seems to be, yeah, so good question, Nash. It seems to be the combination therapy. Um, it's particularly the thiopurines that seem to be the trigger. And it's particularly in, in, in young males. And it's a different cancer from the ones in the EBV negative ones where they get that, uh, uh, B cell uh, proliferative um, yeah, lymphoma. Okay, yeah, all right. So yeah, it's, it is, it's definitely the thiopurines that are the, the ones here that are most problematic. Yeah, no, great. Uh, Professor Kasimidis, oh, okay. Please go ahead, and then Chris um, would love to hear any comments or questions that you might have. Okay? Yeah, there was just one question with your first talk, where I think um, Jill asked about the risk of infection with FMT in patients who are immunosuppressed. Yes. Um, and it is a concern, but we've been lucky. We have done quite a few in patients who are immunosuppressed, and we haven't had a problem. But it does remain a concern, um, and screening is important, although... Yeah, it's easier now with the with the panel that you can do, but before that it made it quite difficult because we were doing limited screening. Um, but yeah, remains a concern. Yeah, thanks. And can you you run an FMT program, isn't it? Uh, yes, but we don't have um I don't have a regular donor. Um because I have a few concerns about if the patient knows who the donor is and something goes wrong. Um, so we tend to use family members, or if someone else has responded and they've recently donated, we will ask them would they give a second donation, provided the patient's comfortable with an unknown donor, but we don't inform them who the donor is. And would you say that most of the patients you've treated are actually non-IBD patients? Um, no. There were quite a few non-IBD, but there were quite a lot of IBD patients as well. But I don't know if that's because I have quite a few IBD patients myself. 
um, because the, the ones we looked at were referred were from my practice or referred into my practice. So obviously I've got quite a few IBD patients, so it, it's probably skewed. Right, right. Thanks, Kay. Sianda, I'm happy to see you've got your hand up. Why don't you please put on your camera and talk to us? Don't be shy. Hi, Prof. There you are. Hello. Um, <laughs> with regard to, thank you for a great presentation. Um, with regards to TB, um, the is the TB prophylaxis is the literature for INH derived from the HIV literature? Um, because I think fundamentally the difference is those patients you then start on ARVs and they immune reconstitute, whereas our patients, you know, you're giving them immune suppressives. So it's, it's it would seem to me you're going in the opposite direction. Um, and then are the other regimens better at preventing breakthrough TB infections? So if you use a combination of RIF and INH versus INH alone, um, and lastly, the risk of resistance to um, if you are using INH um, as a monotherapy. Okay, so first of all, yes, a lot of the data was de derived from the HIV populations. Um, so yeah, I suppose theoretically that could have interfered with results, but I, I very much doubt it. Um, in terms of the different regimens, they all seem to be quite equivalent. The rifamycin regimens, which are recommended by the CDC, for example, above the, the older combinations like INH and RIF and INH, they're very expensive. The bonuses of them is that you can give them for very short courses rather than this nine-month story. And we know patients, compliance is a problem. So that's really the only benefit of those agents. In terms of resistance, the one that we've always worried about is rifampicin rather than INH. Um, and apparently this does not appear to be much of a problem. So the infectious diseases folk don't seem to worry at all about using um, rifampicin as a prophylactic or treatment for latent TB, not prophylaxis. And just to add, when I've discussed the infectious disease people, they actually worry about resistance if you're going to use RIF with INH. So they much prefer the monotherapy for nine months. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because we use it for treatment. So, yeah. So that seems to be the better choice uh, amongst all the evils. Professor Kassinidis, I also saw uh, Prof Ali. Um, any uh, comments? Mish, yeah, Mesh, uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't start the video because I'm also inappropriately dressed. But uh, just to say <laughs> that, um, <laughs> just to just just to say and really compliment the two of you on these presentations, I can't remember coming across so many clinical nuances followed by the most up to date evidence based data. I, I mean, I learn something every single time. So really, congratulations! But it's the minutity of the clinical kind of nuances that you're presenting that I think make these presentations absolutely outstanding. And hence, you can see the numbers that really skyrocketed and are remaining very well. So congratulations to both of you. I enjoy them immensely. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you. Very kind of uh, you. Dimash, there's a before we finish, there's a question on the chat. This is for you. Which one is better in the second recurrence of C. diff infection, FMT or Rifaximin? Look, in a resource-constrained um, um, situation, really, we don't generally have availability to any of them. But I would think that rifaximin might work out cheaper because remember, with FMT, as uh, Dr. Carlson was saying, the screening of even the one donor is unbelievably prohibitively expensive. So that is a huge cost all in itself, you know, the processing of the stool and so forth. So I would think that uh, if you had to choose rifaximin, it's probably cheaper. But as I said, we don't have it in the state sector. So I think for a second recurrence, you might want to go vanco pulsed and tapered. So you do for a, a, a certain dose for one week, and then you reduce the dose for uh, once a week and twice. So there's a regimen for uh, tapered and pulsed uh, vancomycin. I think that would probably be your best bet uh, in, our set, in, in our setup. Uh, Kay says rifaximin doesn't carry risk of infection, so safest to use before FMT. Yeah, so there's another reason, uh, the safety profile to go for that uh, before FMT, uh, if you have uh, access to either of them. 
But I think generally for most of us, it will be uh, oral vancomycin with or without uh, metronidazole, depending on the, the condition of the patient. Are we, are we out of time? We are I out think of so. time. Yeah, we are. All right. Well, I then just have to thank you, Joe, for an excellent, excellent presentation. I learned a lot myself from that. So thank you for, for that and for highlighting these really important uh, points. And then of course, I need to thank ECHO uh, at uh, um, New Mexico, as well as the ECHO India team. They helped me set up the poll questions today, but they're always in the background uh, assisting us with these meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you to Karen and Cheryl, uh, without whom we cannot do any of this. Much appreciated uh, for your efforts, uh, especially during the week leading up to the meetings. Uh, Chris, again, thank you so much uh, for your kind uh, support of all these um, uh, programs that we have going. We would not be able to do this without uh, the support uh, and encouragement of the Gastro Foundation. I'd like to thank the sponsors. Sometimes they are able to make these meetings. So if anybody is there listening, thank you very, very much. Just to remind you that the recordings are all available nicely um, uh, tabulated uh, on the Gastro Foundation website to review at your own leisure. And then next week uh, is pathology, which uh, if you love uh, hepatology and you love histology, I think is always a fantastic uh, with Prof. Uh, Martin Hill. Uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for your participation, for your interest, and we really appreciate the support. Our last meeting is gonna be at the end of the year. Uh, so we will see you then our last IBD gecko. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Thanks. you, girls. Cheers, everybody. Thank Have you. a good evening. Excellent. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.